appreciate what is possible from a slope of this steepness to be able to transform it into this forage garden, a perma garden as it's called here. So a combination between uh, permaculture principles, a forage garden type of approach and biointensive farming systems that um, Jorge will talk about as well. What's amazing, I think, is too that this is a public park. This is the commons. This is open food space. Um, the council owns the land, but the land is managed by the parklands and has given approval for this group to actually do it. And for the first little while, you weren't able to dig or put anything in. So they just basically had the fruit trees in what you call gene bags made out of genes sewn up and put the plants in that and then mounded up all the mulch around them and eventually those genes it's a very smart idea instead of having it as a pot which you then have to take out and plant the, the genes just kind of buy the grade into all of the material around and then they become situated there so you can see each of the beds has this raised thing but then the soaks in here and then you've got the next terrace and that soaks in here this is actually building soil, adding and adding and adding and, and enlivening the soil through the plants. So this whole idea is that the more life you have going on in the soil, the more life that it's going to bring. Life likes to bring life, like it's lifing. If it's kind of empty and dead and you're waiting and digging and soiling it, it's just going to um, you know, actually make it harder to get started. What you can see here too is that in amongst the fruit trees, so this is, while the fruit trees are small, there's a whole lot of space in between. So this group is using this beautifully, the self-seeding greens and then they're planting other greens in, in amongst it. Um, so it's a way of really cultivating the most of the space. So all of what's going in here are the things that people often binge or try and get away and in some places even burn. You know, it's the, it's the stuff you want to get out of the garden, whereas here, if you put it in the garden, and literally deep in it. What that's doing is feeding the soil life and feeding the mycelium. So I don't know if you've heard of the whole mycelial network concept. <clears throat> I think it's absolutely brilliant um, that we now understand that a lot more, that really the best way to garden is having big beds that feed the mycelial network that connects all of the plants in this. So this garden, all of it, is a community. It's not like this is a bed, that's a bed, and that's a bed. Because you have this mycelium network that can connect between all the plants instead of having a raised garden bed like a dead patch and then a raised garden bed a dead patch, life can't really get across that so well. Whereas this, there's these pathways of connection and interconnection throughout the whole. So the bigger our community of life is in our garden, the more it's going to thrive. So again, we can see lots of comfrey that, you know, so if you want to get started, things like comfrey, wood chips, kind of edulas, pigeon pea, um, lemongrass, are some of those amazing starters, and bananas, of course, because a banana gives you so, so much. You know, this, this thing that I was talking about earlier too, about thinking about designing, not just for what you can get, like how is this improving the soil? How is this creating pollinator habitat? And even just the fact that this has mass means that you know underneath there, there may well be frogs and lizards and other things that are there. They're going to be part of this amazing system. The fruit trees are all young. So in between the fruit trees now is a waste of space unless you do something. So what Jorge and his, and his volunteers here have been doing um, have been planting in between all the fruit trees. And this is one of the methods that they... Look at that soil, isn't it amazing? Mm, beautiful. So the double intensive growth, that means we don't tend the soil, but we move the, the soil. So that is one dip, that is a 30 centimeter, and that is the double dip. So we fold the, the lower part, we have to take off. 
So the microorganisms, the lower, have different air, uh, aerobic or anaerobic, the, the, the top. The microorganisms, the top, should be tied with the top and not turn, no, no exposed to the sun. We do that when we prepare the garden only. Yeah. yeah. And that's like air down. Yeah, and, and, and the nutrient as well, no? Okay. So often we prepare the garden on the top. We bring a, a fertilizer compost. Prepare on the top, but each time when you move, some of the nutrient coming down. But the more important is just to lose. What we're looking is, is for that loose. So if we often work with both. Now the idea is not to turn that one, but you cut the soil and put on the next one. So the important thing with this method of gardening is that there's also perennials that are in here. Because one of the things that happens is when you think about those mycorrhizal fungi, like they're threads. And if they get chopped by digging, for example, so what you're doing is making sure that the environment is right for the different microorganisms, but it's those fungal threads that can get chopped. But if you have perennial plants like this, they become the harbours of that life. It will recolonise into that space. But the root grow with the tree. If the tree has dust yeah. on the top, that means the root is kind of that volume. The interesting thing to keep in mind, if you're thinking about, if you've got some fruit trees already and you want to feed your fruit trees to think about feeding around the drip line because that's where the trees have naturally evolved so you know if you think about where the water drops off and it brings in the nutrients from the leaves like the bird poo and everything it drops down here and that's where most of the feeder roots are so if you feed around the outside edge there it's not putting compost in and around the trunk mm. put it right you know right around the edges so we do that at bio intensive at a double dip that means 30 centimeter another 30 centimeter 60 centimeter dip because uh, the root looking for the nutrient down and no way. And that way we can plant more plant together because each plant is going to have enough nutrient if they actually going easier down. So in that way we can yeah, plant more close together each plant, but planting different plants in between. Mm. And we planting on, on triangle, so it's a, always it's a even and become a green mulch in between the plant because the child of one plant keep the the soil uh, covered enough not not to allow many other uh, wild head to, to grow yes. so it's controlled that way but because the, some plant especially the bigger one going to take more time you know, uh, four or to six months to grow to fruiting other plant other small green uh, need less spy and can grow in one month or six weeks. So it's always looking for those niches. This is a gap. You go, oh, what can I put in there? It's like, oh, I can plug in a beetroot in there or put in a, you know, a bok choy or something. It's like always just noticing. That's why, you know, being out in the garden. You can start to see what's going on with what Jorge was showing you before. So there's the, tra the plants in between and then there's lots of different sorts of vegetables growing in here. Um, herbs and vegetables, flowers. So this this garden is being used for educational purposes as part of the parklands. Yes. Is there any other like intention for any of maybe the produce that it's made? Well, um, Roy, I was talking before about before the produce was being sent to the neighbourhood centre, mm. and now the idea is to actually make um, value-added produce, share it amongst the volunteers teach people how to use the foods here mm -hmm. and teach people how to make gardens. So a lot of the food that was being sent wasn't understood about actually how to use it. It's different. And so the, the key for this garden is to go, this is the way that you can grow different kinds of food all year round. This is how you can set it up at your place. Here's some cuttings and here's some materials to get it going. 
and um, and this is how you prepare it. So the of years we've been planting mainly food crops um, mm -hmm. and then the harvesting on a Thursday and take it to the Narang Neighbourhood Centre so that they can help with organic produce in their food packages for people who just need a little bit more help. So how can I design the pathways so that I can handle that volume of water coming down? Well, I think what they've done here is really, really great example for you. So you could explain a bit more, but what they've done is done deep trenches and then filled them up with the, the, the material so, so that it actually acts like a sponge. So you can walk on the pathway, but it's holding the moisture in and soaking it into the into the ground table, the water table below. But I think this is a really interesting thing to keep in mind. You just said 600,000 litres. Can you imagine the size of 600,000 litre tanks at the top of the hill? Like if you were to actually collect and store and pump that amount of water and have it in a tank, we often think about, oh, we're going to collect water into tanks and then use that. The best, absolutely the best space to store water is in your soil. That is the most, that is the first spot. Um, and then from that, then we supplement that with others. So if you can get it to be stored in the soil, so that means building the soil as a sponge. So you could actually reimagine this whole garden and think of it as a sponge garden. Yeah, come on up, come on up into this spot. And just as you walk along, feel, feel the sponginess. You know, I always feel bad about walking. <laughs> Like it brings that, there's a sense of aliveness in this, but what it is, it's, it's a, it is a sponge. This garden has become like a sponge. So as the water's coming down the hill, it's getting caught in this swale here, soaking in and being held in the spongy material that is the breaking down of this, um, this chipmunk. Um, so in and amongst all of these plants, so there's the bananas. I mean, you've got to love bananas. Have a look at what's going around on the edge of here, like oh, the banana, banana trunks. trunks. What's, what you don't see is that all of the pathways too, that sponginess you felt, in the ditches are banana stalks covered with branches and covered over with this, the, um, the chip bark as well. So that's all soaking down in there. Wow. I often use banana stalks. Once they're finished fruiting, I'll grab it and lay it down in the middle of a garden. So it just helps to add organic matter, to slow down water and, and all sorts of things. Yeah. So, so the, just generally what you can see then is this series of starting at the top, adding organic matter, building in these terraces, putting in the main species, filling in the gaps with um, pioneer species, then keeping on filling in the gaps with vegetables and herbs and understories so that gradually over time, there's this multi-layered effect of a food forest um, growing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's great. It's a really good system. So it's good to be able to see this, to know that you know it's possible and that it works. And that, you know, that the, the import of water and the import of nutrients, once you get this set up, is so much more diminished. So your, your work in these, the design thinking and the establishment and that's really kind of where the sort of that, that permaculture design thinking comes in because it's about all the, like instead of racing out and doing a whole lot of hard work, it's like doing the hard work in the thinking stage and then implementing that so you know where everything's going to go, you've got all your levels right and you map it out. And if, I think what's interesting too that you mentioned the other day when I was here was that the more that the garden is getting established, the less that you need to bring in. You know, it's that kind of bringing in stuff is... The Kickstarter. Once you get the starter happening, the life starts to take over the organic matter, and you just start to get those that circular economy happening within your own garden space. And I think you know that's a really important lesson that you've been able to demonstrate here. Yeah, it's great. This one here is a macaranga. So that's a native, um, it's a native pioneer species. So what you can see here is a lot of pioneers. So we've got mulberries are pioneer, the ice cream bean is a pioneer, the bananas are pioneer. The, um, cassavas and all these plants you see are really starting to come up to create the microclimate and the aliveliness in the garden to be able to get things going. So macaranga is a native one. Um, what you can do with that one is um, a great plate. Actually, um, if I've got one in my I've got one in my garden that's really big like that you can't reach, but I have another one that I keep lower so that if you're having a barbecue or something, you just grab a whole lot of those and. But you can also use banana leaf for that just to line that up. Yeah. But then there's uh, well, what I mean, what else can you do with banana? So okay, we know that the banana fruit, fruit ripe yellow is edible. What else can you 
the banana flower, the banana, the little, the little mini bananas. The green banana flower. Um, in Africa, one of the main foods that we ate there was something called matoke, which is a green banana mash. And interestingly, it's a different type of starch, which makes it like it's a much more healthy and digestible starch and very filling. Um, what about the leaves? What do you can use the leaves for? Oh, food cooking. Wrapping food. Yeah, have you ever been to um, countries where they actually use the, the yeah, you steam? Yeah, yeah. You steam, you do little wraps and you steam in that. Mm -hmm. um, plates for your barbie. Yeah. Um, what else? You can eat the banana skin, yes. A couple of decades ago, I was working in, a, in an Indonesian village and one of the recipes they had there was these banana skin um, patties. Wow. They were amazing. I've, I've never known that before either. Wow. And the other thing that I heard too is that you can, I haven't eaten it yet, but you can eat the, the core of the banana stalk. So anyway, uh, you know, it's a herb. It's an oversized herb and all of it's, all of it's edible and useful and functional. And it's a great thing too to create this fast shade and life. And, uh, and in the middle of this section, you know, they've got the nursery, so it provides the extra shade for that. If you just had the shelter, it would still probably get too hot in there, particularly in the summertime. So it creates microclimate rapidly, and that's what you want. You want life and microclimate rapidly uh, in getting these forage gardens happening. And another plant that's helpful with that is um, things like this. This is a legume. This is um, ice cream bean. Um, ice cream bean grows really rapidly um, in the subtropics. And you can just constantly chop and drop it as well. It will get to a massive great tree. So you can see they're managing it to keep it low. What I use it for is to create conditions for other plants because it really grows fast uh, and you can just keep chopping and dropping it. And then you get, it's a sign here, it explains it. You get these velvet-like pods. They're amazing. They're like brown velvet inside. You open them up and they have um, white soft stuff around these black seeds. And so you just pop the whole lot in your mouth and you just sort of suck off the white face. It's a bit like ice cream, but soft and um, warm and sweet and it's just lovely. So they're really interesting. And then all you need to do, with a lot of these subtropical plants, all you need to do is like just to take the seeds straight from your mouth, pop it into the ground or a pot, and then you get a new plant. You can't take it and put it in your bag and wait for later because as soon as the subtropical plant seed dries, it's no longer viable. So take it straight from your mouth, <laughs> put it in put it in into the soil. Thinking about how much diversity we can fit into a small space. You know, a, a tree like a mulberry, if you allow it to, will fill up this whole space. But if you want to have these multiple multiple plants, you know, maybe there's something that sometimes to bring it more and then we can do chop and drop. Also I find that um, mulberry stakes make a really good living fence. You can plant them and then you can weave the bits together and just keep trimming it back. Um, what else do you use mulberry for? Mulberry, has anyone ever had mulberry leaf tea? Um, mulberry leaves um, in places like Korea and Japan, the dry mulberry leaves, you can buy packets of them. And I was trying to find out information about whether it's okay just to have the fresh ones. And yes, of course. So you, all you need to do is just go and grab a handful of the fresh mulberry. It's like a green tea. It has really lovely... Um, uh, immune boosting properties. There are so many different sorts of leaves of trees that you can eat and it's you know we often think about oh it's what's you know what's this level that's the greens but I use a lot of trees for either food or for teas. Um, what are some of the other trees that you could use leaves of for example? Moringa. Moringa totally. Bay leaf. Bay leaf. Yes mm, of yeah. course bay leaf. Curry leaf. Curry leaf. Mm. Mm. Yep fantastic. Um, I use citrus leaves as flavour in all sorts of things. You just grab a leaf and toss it into a soup or you might have it um, as a tea. Um, same with the uh, lemon myrtle. Magnificent. Yeah, I love lemon myrtle. Oh yeah. my That's gosh. my favourite. Lemon yeah. myrtle, lemon verbena, lemon balm. Yeah, oh, yeah. I love lemon myrtle. Oh, I make yeah. tea out of it all the time. Yeah. This is called pigeon pea. So pigeon pea is a, um, it's a perennial legume. This one here is a fantastic thing to get going really quickly. So it creates um, habitat. Uh, it's also great for mulch. It's also something you can use as a chop and a drop. So you're creating your own organic matter. So pigeon pea is a pioneer plant. It's something that we call in permaculture 
um, a pioneer species because it grows up fast, it's short-lived, and it's highly productive. So um, it has also lots of pollinator attracting flowers. Um, you can see on it, it's got those little pea type flowers, so you know it's the legume family. That also means that it's collecting nitrogen and storing it on its roots. So when it dies, it becomes a slow release fertilizer in the soil. And it's got for birds, it starts to create habitat. Um, and also on it, you get these peas. Now, you know, often these end up being mostly for the wild. But if you keep it low and you can harvest yourself, this is one of the main plants that's been used for 3,000 years. So you just collect the, the dried peas. Off because there's some pea pods there. I don't know if you can reach those or show those. But um, you want it to get too big. After a while, you can chop it, drop it back, and then it will re-sprout again. And so this is helping to build the organic matter of the soil, create mulch and whole lot of materials. Um, and then also this one here. I don't know if you're familiar with this one. I'm just looking for another one. This is canna, edible canna, canna edulis. So at the base of this are uh, like edible subtropical potatoes. But mostly what we use it for is to get organic matter growing really quickly. So you grab a little section, chuck it in, and then all of a sudden you've got this, this edge where things can kind of work up again. So you just keep taking that and putting it up. Everything just keeps going back uphill. So see that one up there? It's got spiky little seed pods on it. And at the base of it, it has like rhizo roots. It's, it's not edible, it's like chunky and thick. Whereas this one has the bulbous roots. And when you slice it open, it's like white, starchy looking potato underneath. It does have a little red flower, but not as many as that. And it never gets the spiky top. What I like about it is that you don't actually have to dig the soil to harvest it. You can see, you look around the top and there it is. You just see the one that's got a little shoot and you snap it off. You leave the mother in the ground with all its roots going deeper down and just keep snapping off the little bits and allowing it just to keep going and going and going. So it makes growing um, absolutely so much easier. All right. I just wash them off, take off the root parts um, and just wash off the dirt and I just cook the whole thing. The, the peel comes off after you cook them anyway, so don't bother. If they're young like this, it doesn't take long at all. So they actually can be quite soft in quite a short period of time. They're delicious. Potato. You, you could grow it in a pot, you can grow it on the veranda, you can grow it. Anywhere. And it's your own source of mulch as well. So you can just keep topping the tops and keep getting an enormous amount of um, material that you can put back into your garden. I think those things are really, really fantastic. Here has actually had a stalk coming out of it, and I often use these for chop and drop mulch as well. Constant source of materials, a really great thing to create a living hedge. In summer, they're vigorous. Um, in winter time, they're sort of slowing down. So that's yeah. one of the things you'll often see in, in gardening books is say, you know, don't plant anything around citrus plants. Have you ever read that or heard that? Yeah, I think actually one of the best things to plant around citrus is country. And um, so I do this all the time too in my gardens. What it has is it has deep roots. So it's not competing with the shallow roots. It has deep roots that are drawing up nutrients from way down below, bringing them up to the surface. It's actually shading the soil a bit in our climate, which is important. So it doesn't get so dry or hot and the, and the life in the soil doesn't get killed. Um, and then as the, you can either chop and drop the materials and put them down or keep growing and growing or you can just allow it to be there and it will just naturally, leaves will naturally die and feed the soil and then more leaves will come and you know it's like a do nothing approach to composting and feeding these plants here so um, comfrey is great and you can also harvest the leaves, add them into compost as a compost activator, um, grab leaves, put them into a bucket and make liquid fertilizers, it's so so useful. And also to help stabilise soils along the edge if you're creating a new garden, you just plant. What you need is a section of root. So if you dig up one and you get a root this long, you can just chop it up and plant those segments. Um, so we've got things like yarrow around the base here too. Um, yarrow is an ancient medicinal plant and you can make yarrow teas out of it. Yarrow is also a compost activator. Um, um, this one here, oh my gosh, look at that. I've never seen What's it like that? that. That is extraordinary. I've only ever seen the single one. This is Lagos spinach, but you have Lagos spinach kangaroo paw plant. Hand. I've never seen this before. Anyway, so this is Lagos spinach and it's in its flowering stage, but when it's younger, it has an enormous amount of leaf on it. 
and um, you can still be harvesting the leaves from this. Um, this is a, a cooked green that I use all the time and yep. it just it will self seed. So inside here there's little black seeds that are forming. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you can see some of them are starting to form. Mm. Oh yeah there they are. All right. So if you wanted to plant this in your garden I would say just take one of the flower heads yep. and then um, wow. sprinkle that in your garden you'll get leg or spinach. Um, so that's and you know in Lagos in in Africa mm. these kind of these kind of self-seeding hardy annual resilient robust plants are essential absolutely essential these are amaranth yeah, all amaranth. yeah yeah so yeah so there's green and purple amaranth and actually amaranth amaranth is one of the most cultivated greens in places like China you know it's absolutely essential but and also India so if you've got a self-seeding patch that's coming up and you want to eat it you can just thin out the seedlings that come up like that um, or you can let them come up big maybe just let a couple of big ones come up and be plucking out the ones in between and just you know toss that in your stir fry and you know if you're thinking about health and well-being we kind of know from a nutritional perspective that we need to have multiple colors so growing our own purples and all different yeah. colors so it's an ancient grain, so you can eat the leaves, you can eat these. It's kind of a bit of a fiddly thing getting the seeds though, they're very small. Um, but when these go dry, what you can do is you can snip them off and pop them in a bag and shake it and wash it around a bit and then blow off the chaff. Or what you can do, which is what I quite often do, is at this stage, I'll start to snip off the flowers and just eat the flowers with the seeds all in it while the, while the flower bit's still edible. And that's also really brilliant. Just put in a salad or something? Well, I just cook it up as a stir fry. Stir fry. 82% of your um, iron needs come from a cup of amaranth seed. Grab the flowers and I toss them into a stir fry as well. Um, I probably wouldn't eat them so much raw. The wild amaranths and there's all different sorts of amaranths that come and um, so you can eat it at this stage if it's where you don't want it just pull it out and that can be your, your greens for the day uh, so um, and one of the many different sorts of sweet potato so um, the sweet potato greens as I mentioned before are also edible this one's a beautiful purple one and then you know as you go around here you can just see how there's these there's these big beds with these multiple different um, things growing in them oh here dandelion it's even got a label on it but you know if you go into the stores in some places you'll see all these chemicals <laughs> dandelion killer but um dandelion every single part of dandelion is absolutely amazing oh, yeah, take yeah. some seeds and shake them around because they help to they're great ecologically they help to break up the soil they're great medicinally you can take the root and make a coffee alternative out of it Yes, absolutely. So you know, this, yeah. So this one here is actually probably one that has been planted. This is a Suriname spinach, and we might see another example of that. But middle and winter time, it dies back a bit. But in summertime, it's probably fill up this whole space with abundant green. So again, this is a you can eat the the leaves and the shoots. Uh, yeah, great. See, once you start to notice this um, umbelliferi family, see, it's like the umbrella. So it's of that same family. So yes. Do you, you know, wait and get a little root and eat it, or the leaf and that? Um, well, I would just, I just eat the the leaves and the flowers, and yeah. Yeah. So these, this is like a, a wood sorrel. Um, have a nibble. It's really, really nice. And like a lot of these are actually herbs. That, yeah, taste it. It's like got lemony flavour. The blue top. Who's got that in their gardens? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever um, had got lots of little um, itchy ant bites or things like that in the garden? You can actually use that. The tops of those. Rub that in. Or with my kids when they've kind of gone into little ants' nest or got lots of little ticks on them, I actually go and grab all of the flower tops, put them in a bath, and then I put the kids in the bath with that. It really help. You know, you might look at it and you go, oh, that plant. But, you know, there's way more to all of this than meets the eye. Now, which one? Are the blue tops good for anything else? Um, well, I leave them in terms of them 
like it's creating a cover so it's going to keep the soil cooler it's got organic matter you know i try to just sort of knock them down a bit but it's not really edible it's not edible no not not that i know what do we do the glutamine you eat it oh great thank you no well see this is the thing thank you it's a leaf of this, a leaf of that, a leaf yes. of this. And they all bring in that whole system of nutrients and that balanced diet that we need. Um, and, they're there, so. and then these sorts of things. Who knows what that is? Scurvy oh. weed. Yeah. So scurvy weed, what does that tell you? You don't get scurvy. <laughs> so what is that? Vitamin C. Ta-da! So that's an edible weed. Um, let's keep wandering along and sort of walk through going, we'll head on our way up to the top there. So as you can see as you come along, underneath the tree there's all different sorts of things like yarrow here, there's amaranth, this one's nasturtium, so all of these are edible. There's some sweet potato here, um, I'm sorry to stand on here, but this is chickweed. So chickweed is, you know, a weed but it's also edible. Oh, it's fantastic as a salad drink. Imagine press sandwiches. <laughs> you know, like, it just grows. I did a compost, just mentioned this. Um, it's more of a bush tucker garden. So we've got Davidson's plum, um, native hibiscus, uh, there's the macadamias. And then this one here, if you go past, just um, gently grab a leaf, crush it and smell it. It's the native mint bush. Oh, it's amazing. And then, you know, different sorts of berries. Um, the wattles, the wattle, so you can get wattle gummy seed. Gummy. Yeah. Is that gummy gummy? Yes, yeah. yeah, gummy. Grab resources from a fruit food shop, and then you've made the the dry compost. You made the liquid compost. You've um, you've got all these different kind of elements that are taken off one thing. So you can either just go and bury it straight, or you can amplify its possibility by doing all of this. And you can scale these sorts of things up and down to make a backyard system. And then, and then the next part of activating all of this. So I mean, what you're doing is supercharging those veggie scraps that you get for free into the most magnificent um, natural fertilizers for your garden. And what I think that is interesting too is that as you've developed the garden you're needing this less which is why you do it because you've got so much of it there and the system itself is starting to feed itself as well so I think that's an also interesting part of this conversation.